Okay. Hello everyone, Mabuhay. Welcome to today's International Nursing Webinar entitled Evidence-Based Community Interventions for Diabetes and Hypertension Among Filipino Americans, Global Implication. So my name is Karen Luel Rin, and I'm one of your host moderator today, hosting straight here in Nantalita, Philippines. So together with me is Sir Rolando Antonio, a colleague from the Cavite State University College of Nursing. Hi, sir. Hi, Ma'am Karen. Good, good day, everyone. Okay, so he will be joining us in a while during the Q&A portion, and both of us are very excited for today's webinar. So before we formally start our webinar proper, join us and let us first unite in prayer to be led by Ms. Jocelyn A. Mayuga from the Cavite State University College of Nursing to be followed by the Philippine National Anthem. Ah, okay, audio with Dupo. Okay. Let us bow our head and put ourselves in the holiness of God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for giving us a chance to be united today. Thank you for the opportunity to care for the world and the human humanity that you have made. We ask you to bless our gatherings this morning and favor us with your presence as we seek your guidance in hopes to further enrich our knowledge and strengthen our partnership. Steer our intentions to align with your will and multiply our efforts as only you can. Guide our hearts and minds as we listen to what our webinar speaker will be imparting us. Bless all the allied medical professionals at the front and protect them from this pandemic. This we pray in the holy mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Mga kababayan, huwag ang sangaw ang kapitin. Morning, sir. Good morning, Karen. So, to all, magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on evidence-based community interventions for diabetes and hypertension among Filipino Americans, global implications. But first, I would like to greet the uh, Dean of the uh, College of Nursing, Dr. Evelyn Del Mundo, uh, all the faculty members and non-academic staff of the college. Also, uh, to our guest speaker, uh, she will be introduced uh, properly later. And all the participants, faculty members from all other uh, universities and uh, colleges attending this uh, webinar. Isang mapagpalang umaga po sa ating lahat. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network for organizing and inviting our College of Nursing to co-host this webinar. We really welcome collaborations like this, and I hope that this activity signals the beginning of more productive partnership with you. Secondly, I think the most essential, allow me to thank and salute you, our Filipino nurses here and abroad uh, for passionately doing what you do and for showing the world how excellent Philippine nurses are. And indulge me for saying that CBSU 
or the Kabiti State University is proud to have produced highly technical, competitive, and dedicated nurses who are now gainfully employed in various healthcare facilities here in the country and overseas. I, I wish I am delivering this welcome message to you face to face and not virtually. Nevertheless, to the organizers and participants, my warmest greetings to all of you. And also to our resource speaker, who will be properly introduced later, Dr. Danet Lapis Blanc. Welcome po and thank you for your time. The statistics says that about 422 million people worldwide have diabetes and 1.6 million deaths are directly attributed to diabetes each year. That's uh, based on World Health Organization report. This webinar is indeed a very good platform to share professional experiences, especially evidence-based community intervention in handling diabetes and hypertension. I am sure that public health decision makers, practitioners, community leaders, or anyone who can influence the health of the community will greatly benefit from this activity. May you all stay engaged throughout the webinar and then, and when all this is over, I hope to personally welcome you, welcome you all here at Kabiti State University alive and kicking. Again, magandang araw po sa ating lahat. Stay safe, stay healthy, and God bless us all. Uh, thank you, Mama Karen, our moderator, uh, for inviting me to have this welcome message uh, to all our participants in this uh, international webinar for the College of Nursing. Thank you, and magandang umaga po muli. Thank you very much for Dr. Robles. So <clears throat> now let's hear the opening remarks of the president of the Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network, Professor Violeta Lopez. I think we have her via phone. Good day, doctor. Good day and good afternoon to all of you. And thank you for everybody who participate in this uh, webinar. It's, it's just quite difficult during this time to be able to connect to everybody in terms of um, internet in different parts of the world. And I'm sorry that I cannot uh, connect to the uh, Zoom at this time. I was hoping to be able to see you all um, personally uh, from this computer. Anyway, um, the topic is really very important today because diabetes is a chronic medical condition that is common around the world. It is a serious condition that can affect the quality of life. Several programs and initiatives help treat or manage diabetes and diabetes health related problems to prioritize national response to diabetes. Of course, a number of research evidence of clinical and practice have been conducted to develop evidence-based guidelines. People with diabetes can manage their own diabetes if provided good information, education, and continuing support. Self-care to manage diabetes at home and in the community is moving forward to help people with diabetes, no matter what the age is, or no matter the ethnicity is, or no matter what is the gender of the people inflicted with this uh, chronic condition. So today, the topic to be presented by Associate Professor Bloom is timely. And on behalf of the Filipino International Nursing Diaspora Network, I thank you and welcome to this webinar, Professor Blue. I hope that you will have a very good um, session today and have a very productive day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lopez. 
So at this point, I just want to read the webinar objectives for today. So the webinar aims to first update the participants on the issues and trends pertaining to evidence-based community interventions for people who have diabetes and hypertension. Next, of course, to provide a platform to discuss and share the professional experiences of the resource speaker on the interventions employed for diabetes and hypertension and its global implication. And lastly, to build alliance and partnership to enhance the College of Nursing's linkages among international organizations. I also have some webinar reminders to cover about this presentation and the webinar platform. First, as you may notice, your microphones have been muted. This is to avoid background noises. But nevertheless, you can always ask your questions later. You can key in your questions in the Q&A um, chat box later. You can also uh, use this uh, pattern for us to properly address you later, like your name, your profession, and your location. And also, we'd like to encourage everyone to please help us spread what is happening about this webinar in the social media and share today's webinar through your social networks. At the end of the webinar, we will be sending the link of the webinar evaluation form in the chat box, and it will be greatly appreciated if you could please complete our forms. This will enable us to evaluate uh, what we did for today's webinar, and your feedbacks will be greatly appreciated. So. Um, today, just like what I said a while ago, the College of Nursing, we are also thrilled because this is actually the second collaborate, collaboration from the, our second collaboration from the Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network. And it's nice to really partner with them, especially in disseminating nursing or health related knowledge. So with that, at this point, uh, I'd like to call in the dynamic, our very dynamic and very supportive dean of the College of Nursing, Dr. Evelyn M. Del Mundo, to please introduce our webinar speaker. Dr. Del Mundo. To our university president, Dr. Hernando D. Robles, Professor Violeta Lopez, the president, CEO of Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network, to all vice presidents, deans, and administrators of different colleges and universities in the country and abroad, faculty members and staff, alumni, students, guests, ladies, and gentlemen, a pleasant day to all. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, who is going to talk to us about the evidence-based Community Interventions for Diabetes and Hypertension Among Filipino Americans Global Implications. This is a topic in which we should all be deeply interested because it focuses on the health of diverse and vulnerable populations. Our speaker is an associate professor and the director of international programs at the School of Nursing, University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. She is a registered nurse from the Philippines with graduate degrees in neuroscience and clinical investigation. She completed her Bachelor of Science Honors degree at the University of Queensland, Australia her Bachelor of Science in Nursing as cum laude at Cebu State University, now Cebu Normal University, Philippines. She had her predoctoral experience at Karonslinska Institute, Sweden, her PhD in Biomedical Sciences at the University of Nottingham, England, and her Master's in Clinical Investigation at the University of Texas Health Science Center of San Antonio, Texas. She completed a postdoctoral scientific appointment at H. Lundbeck AS, Denmark. She is an award-winning professional nurse 
who received numer numerous awards, including, but not limited to, South Texas Nurse Image Maker Award, Ruth Stewart Award for Nurse Imaging, Philippine Nurses Association of America Research Excellence Award, PNAA Nurse Educator Award, Presidential Teaching Award, one of the 25 best nurses of South Texas and was included as fellow of the American Academy of Nursing. Our speaker had a track record funded research on preclinical models for neuropsychiatric disorders, investigating the neurobiological and behavioral mechanisms associated with the effects of stress. She has numerous manuscripts and presented at local, regional, national, and international venues. She co-authored the book, The Neurobiology of Stress-Related Disorders. She has been engaged in translational clinical research on post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as education-based and community service-based diversity research. Funding from the Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute, or the PICORI, has provided her with opportunities to build capacity and engage veterans and Filipino-Americans at a national level on patient-centered outcome research, advocacy, and full partners of research. Her current PICORI-funded study reaches out to Filipino in five states, namely California, Hawaii, Texas, New Jersey, and New York. She and student leaders have funded research to assess and address South Texas, Vietnamese, and South Asian communities' needs. Her main goal is to improve patient outcomes among vulnerable populations, especially veterans, Filipino-Americans, and other Asian Americans. She is a very active with a community. She currently serves on the board of the Philippine American Chamber of Commerce, Central Texas Region, Amer Asian American Alliance of San Antonio, and Philippine Nurses Association of San Antonio. She is a co-chair of the Research Committee of the Philippine Nurses Association of America. She is a member of the House of Delegates for the Texas Nurses Association, and she was an honorary medical commander of the 149th Fighter Wing of the Texas Air National Guard. She regularly conducts diabetes and cardiovascular health screening among Vietnamese, Filipino, and other minority populations in South Texas. She is married to Dr. James Michael Bloom of Footprints Podiatrics, Medicine, and Surgery, a mother of two kids, Dane and Michaela. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our webinar speaker, Professor Maria Donet Lavis Bloom. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for that warm welcome uh, from Dr. Robles, Dr. Del Mondo, and Dr. Lopez. Uh, I would also like to thank Miss Karen, Mom Karen, and uh, Mr. Luis, and of course, uh, uh, Mr. Jerome Babati for this wonderful chance to share with you the little knowledge that I know about um, Filipino Americans and with the hope really of educating and promoting knowledge, disseminating and hopefully putting, leading the fire under your feet to be advocates for community um, interventions to for healthier lifestyle and to prevent diabetes and hypertension. But before I do that, since I can't actually see the chat, 
Can you all perhaps write uh, where are you from, which institution and province and country if you're not from the Philippines? Let me see if I see any chat. Am I able to see the chat, Mom Karen? Um, yes, ma'am. You can actually see it. Just click chat. Oh, Look. wonderful. Oh, wow. We have more Arizona. Wonderful. That's it. Where's Tordeiros from the Philippines? Which part of the Philippines? Maayong buntag sa mga Bisaya. Yeah. CDO, Cagayan de Oro, Iloilo, Cavite, Desmarinas, Cagayan de Oro. Great. So this is all over the Philippines. So welcome. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Maayong buntag sa inyong tanan. I think maayong udto ninyo sa Australia, Kuya Jerome. And good evening from Texas. So I would just like to share a personal note that one of your graduates and previous clinical instructor, Rachel Ganuelas, actually reached out to me uh, and shared that she's, she's from... Cavite State University, and she's really doing well here in Texas as well. Bulacan, Batangas. Very good. Thank you so much for joining with us today. And I, I echo uh, Mom Karen's invite to everyone to please spread this activity, this fine webinar series, because I think it's very, very useful. I'll go and share screen right now. Are you able to see my screen? Not yet, Paul. Mm -hmm. How about that? Yes, Paul. All right, wonderful. So thank you uh, once again to uh, find Philippine Nursing Diaspora Network, and welcome to everyone. So uh, I know there was a set of objectives that were being shared by, by uh, Mom Karen earlier for the activity, and I do have for my presentation uh, some objectives for me and you to be able to perhaps outline some priority health issues among Filipinos in America. And describe a research to address diabetes and hypertension among Filipinos and Americans. And really what I hope that you'll be able to articulate the desire and intention to perhaps engage in community endeavors to help address diabetes and hypertension in your local communities. So just very briefly, Filipinos, Asians is one, the second biggest minority population here in the United States and Filipinos and Filipino Americans represent the third largest Asian group. Now that toggles between second and third. Um, Chinese is always number one, but it toggles between South Asian and Filipinos uh, for the second and third place. And for these 2016, um, statistics, we were the third largest Asian group. And we know from our history, especially as nurses, that a lot of um, Filipinos here actually work in the healthcare industry. We are also in the agriculture and military. So one of the things that you would expect from these professions is that we should be healthy, right? Um, that seemed not to be the case, okay? So there is actually the prevalence of chronic diseases among Filipino Americans is alarming. And this data is very, very kind of, it's outdated. And one of the things that you would find in the literature is that despite the fact that we are the Asians are the second lar largest and Filipino Americans are the third biggest minority uh, uh, um, Asian subgroup and growing, uh, there's actually very limited, but in about early 2010, there were some data that already kind of point out to the fact that there are issues, there are significant serious issues among Filipino Americans. 
And historically, a lot of the studies among, among Asians look, clusters them all together. So Filipinos, Chinese, uh, Vietnamese, um, uh, Korean, South Koreans, uh, South Asians, they lump them all together. And so what happens is that because the profiles of these different subgroups are very, very are not similar, so it evens out. It's just like looking at uh, like a mean, right? So it actually cancels out and it hides the different uh, priority issues with, with the different uh, Asian subgroups. So if you read some of these articles that actually lumps this data together, you would say you would most likely see in the discussion a recommendation of not to lump together Asians in as a one minority group, but to to actually study these different subgroups. And the, what came out of that was that Filipino Americans, in terms of cardiovascular disease and diabetes, are actually higher than the whites, blacks and other Asian groups. And blacks is very, uh, is known to be high and other Asians group like uh, South Asian, like Indians, they are also very high, but ours, we are higher than them at some uh, uh, states. So because of that, um, stroke is a leading cause of mortality. And there are also other health issues uh, in terms of cancer, dementia, depression, gout, and infectious disease. But really, top on the line and priority are cardiovascular diseases and diabetes. So these are old data. And if you want to see more of this, I have published a systematic review last year to um, highlight the different healthcare issues of Filipino Americans um, here in the US. So, this, in the next two slides, I'm just highlighting a couple of studies that actually shows in much later, 2017, although that's like four years ago, that in, indeed there is um, higher odds of developing diabetes among Filipino Americans. And in this study, it's actually non-obese Filipino Americans. So we would think that because we, like Filipinos look, look small, they're less likely not to have diabetes, but that's not to be the case. And, uh, and what, is, what came out a lot of these studies is that for a while the BMI normal in, I guess, main American, um, population or you know WHO is 25 among Asians is actually lower at 23 because if you put it at 25 it actually you are not able to to find a lot of the people who are at risk of for the you you would miss out a lot of those people who were most likely to be pre-diabetics or diabetics because of the higher cutoff end so you, we actually have to to Cut, cut it down to two levels in the 23rd level, which means that uh, if you look at it, they, you would look thin, but you would probably have, most likely have diabetes. Uh, in terms of hypertension, this is again, uh, a paper that was from the Ma group in New York uh, in 2017, and they reported that 67% of Filipino Americans in the eighth community-based organization, um, they actually did community health screening, have hypertension. So indeed, these are the earlier studies and the studies in 2017 support that these are prioritized issues. And is, still, is this still the case? So we want to ask. So I was funded by the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute or PCORI as Dr. Um, Del Mondo shared. And this project was actually is in five state, calif states, California, Hawaii, Texas, New York, and New Jersey. And what I have done is I leveraged the infrastructure of the Philippine Nurses Association of America to recruit academic research collaborators, nurses, uh, to be one of the co-leaders co -le of the initiative in each of the states. So they are nurses, PNA members who are really engaged in the community. So there are already a lot of the PNA chapters, for example, San Antonio, uh, probably other places where you know you have relatives 
are already engaged in health screening, health promotion, and so on and so forth. So I just stop. I just tapped on what are already existing um, infrastructures for for Philippine nurses associations, and recruited a leader for that state, and then I partnered them with what the patient advocate leaders who are community leaders very much engaged in a community with with very high influence very so that they could bring in more filipinos so i they actually went out of the community had a series of focus groups with different stakeholders uh, stakeholders were filipino uh, patients their family members people um, Filipino or non-Filipino who are engaged in nonprofits that might influence Filipino uh, health, health uh, clinicians, and so on and so forth. So in short, a, a stakeholder is someone who, who in some way, in whatever uh, they're doing in the community, can influence health and health care. So what came out of these? So I asked them, so they had done this series of focus groups in their community. So I had asked them at a retreat, and this is the group, uh, there were three people absent, but this is mostly the group. I asked them, so if you can, if you can rank the 10 most prioritized issues in each of the state, what are those? So these are the results from California, and these are my leaders in California. And you will see that diabetes, uh, diabetes, hypertension, cancer are the first three. And of course, there are also other issues with regards to reluctance to talk about health issues, lack of knowledge. Uh, cultural issues with healthcare provider, food choices, and so on and so forth. So that's California for you. And Hawaii, and you can see, you see you'd see Hawaii is um, um, actually listed seven. So they said, these are our health conditions in the left-hand side and in the right-hand side and healthcare related issues. So you would see here, diabetes is number one, the blood pressure is uh, high blood pressure, or hypertension is second and so on and so forth. And on the right-hand side, lack of health insurance, language barriers uh, is a very big issue in Hawaii. And Texas, Texas also here, you would see they actually have not, uh, Texas did not um, have diabetes and hypertension as part, they are number eight. Most of the things that they were in terms of healthcare issues with regards to access to healthcare, cost of health copay and medications, and this could be actually reflective of uh, Texas because we, we, the government, the state is autonomous and uh, they have autonomous infrastructure and the state decided not to expand Medicare. So a lot of issues here may be uh, a reflection of that statewide um, condition. New York and New Jersey. So both the leaders, the community leaders of New York and New Jersey were actually not able to attend and these are my co-leaders and if you know the uh you know about new york and new jersey they're just across the bridge so i actually put them all both together and they came up with hypertension and diabetes and cancer as the first three so you would see here that that though the results from previous studies were early uh 2010 2015 period which data were probably collected in late 2000s that these things are still increasing. And uh, Dr. Robles, Dr. Lopez, actually, and Dr. Del Mondo actually already highlighted how significant diabetes and hypertension is. And so it remains to be so, and it's a constant, constant thing that is plaguing our Filipino American community. So one of the things, so, when after our, our, our retreat, we actually said, so what's next? I mean, like, it's good to know, but, you know, like, it's better if we do something about it. So, so what we had to, so we want to have an intervention. So especially, specifically this um, from our New Jersey, they're like enough data collection, we need to have an intervention. So I, I said, like, you know what, let's look at the literature as to what are the evidence based community interventions. I really, I, I personally, I believe that when a patient is already in the hospital, it's a little bit too late. So you, I think we have to have an intervention in the community where we can prevent things. And I think that would be the biggest uh, use of our resources and we could have a healthier community. So we, my, my students and colleagues, we co conducted a systematic review that looked at um, 
community-based intervention studies to address diabetes and hypertension in the community. And this is a key thing that if you remember the title, that is what it is. And it's good to know these, these things because one, you'll know what worked, two, you'll know what not to do. And there are also a lot of issues like information and data there that could potentially be useful if you plan to have an intervention study. So there were actually four programs. There were six articles that were found and there were six programs that, um, four programs, sorry, that address diabetes among Filipino Americans. So they have, um, uh, uh, and all these, uh, the first two are, were based in California, the third is in Hawaii, and the Stanford Diabetes Self-Management Program is uh, a little bit more diverse. So the next few slides, I would just highlight some of these uh, studies. So the Fit and Trim uh, study uh, by Bender et al. So Dr. Bender is a personal friend and she's really very like a diabetes and community advocate. So they assess these diabetes prevention program based intervention. So what they have, and this really consists of exercise and diet. And what they have done is uh, like provided uh, participants with like smart wearable technology. So they had Fitbit and then they actually were connected through uh, Facebook uh, they had daily diaries and so on and so forth. And what they have found, so this is in San Francisco uh, Bay Area. And what they have found was that one, and if you read this paper, they, there's a lot of nuggets there in terms of working with the Filipino community. So uh, they actually, their goal was to have a 5% reduction in weight. And uh, uh, I think about 80% of those that actually um, achieve that goal, but there were also two to five per, two to five percent that actually gained weight during this. Uh, I mean, but they had um, ninety percent of the enrolled participants completed the intervention, which is a very very big thing because if you remember uh, research designs, longitudinal studies, that's where you get get the greater likelihood of of people actually kind of dropping out. So you're um, because of the length of the study. So an attrition rate of 10% is a really good thing. So they have they have used a lot of cultural tailoring strategies. So they work with Philippine Nurses Association chapters. They work with the Philippine Alliance Club. They, they work with Filipino community uh, partners in order to do this. Uh, Filipino America Go for Health is another project that Dr. Bender uh, like headed. So this is another kind of um, weight, weight loss lifestyle intervention. So a little bit different here is that the fit and trim is was actually designed for obese, overweight, um, uh, and more for type two diabetes risk reduction. So the fill on go for health was actually uh, used for, uh, was with a sample of individuals who were obese uh, with type two diabetes in um, California, Northern California. And um, findings that here were, uh, there was fill, uh, pill um, go for health um, reduced weight and fasting glucose were an H, uh, hemoglobin A1C outcomes were a little mixed. So there was not really like a, a reduction per se, but in some individuals there was reduction. Um, and then they, they had another paper, which was um, uh, the first author was Maglalang, but it's there, they, she is part of the Bender group. And they 50, about 60% report enhanced engagement in, in following up and being uh, like using health technology. So this health technology is use of Fitbit and um, um, computerized tracking and, and also uh, social connection. So health is wealth is actually um, 
study that was done in Hawaii. So there's a lot of Filipinos in Hawaii. I don't know, you probably have relatives there and a lot of Ilocanos. And um, I guess that's where, if you remember, that was one of the issues, the language issues, because uh, some of them, a number of them do not actually speak English well, and they prefer to speak in Ilocano. And um, I kind of, I really, I read this, it was late 2012 and 2014 published. So this was uh, data that was um, collected in early, uh, late, early 2010 probably or before that but they actually what they did was they have a diet exercise in um kind of program that was based at the church so they connected with the church and right after church these people gathered together and um and uh like they did exercises and they did the education and and so on and so forth and I think one of the things that was coming out in our in our group with a PCORI group that I have when we were kind of um, brainstorming as to what's the next step, one of the things that our community leader really emphasized is that if you do have a program for diabetes or hypertension or reduction in ob obesity, do not sell it or do not name it as obesity reduction because it kind of is that has a negative connotation and and people it would turn people off so i think this group inoi and lee cut it hit the nail on the head with this one with health is wealth you know we we know that's a very common passage that we use at home they hone on the church connection and so on and so forth so um they did have only like lower um completion rate than Dr. Bender, 88%. There was weight loss and waste, um, waste size reduction um, in the intervention group. And he said what the significant predictors for weight loss were gender and marital status. All right. So there were participants were really highly satisfied. Although if you read these papers, you would you would note that they have a lot of recommendations of what to do next. For example, I think there was the thing about um, weight loss was only was not required. So some of them actually did not weigh themselves. So that that there might be some bias there in terms of that results, but but they did report that there was a reduction. So um, this stand for diabetes self-management was also done in Hawaii. And uh, this is for the uh, uh, Asian Pacific Island Islanders. So that Asian Pacific Islanders actually include other groups such as, you know, uh, Pacific Islanders uh, from, from those islands around Hawaii. Um, and uh, Filipinos of course are included in this one. So, uh, this is not totally Filipino project, but it, a significant number were Filipinos, 92% were Filipinos, so we included this. So um, they there reported significant reductions in BMI, hemoglobin A1C, total cholesterol, triglyceride, and so on and so forth. Um, they actually, so this the Stanford Diabetes Self-Management Program is a standard program that is put forward. So what they've done is they've made local adaptations, uh, adaptation, cultural adaptations to the program to make it more acceptable. And that's really one of the things that are coming out here uh, in the literature that you need to tailor it to your community as to what is acceptable to them so that they're more likely to, to adhere and in this case, complete the program, but what we're really hoping for is a long-term sustained behavioral change that could lead to healthier um, profile. So studies in terms of um, hypertension, this is again, our systematic review, which was published last year. And there were three programs that address hypertension among Filipino Americans. So the, there's the reach far and note this abbreviation because I'm, I think I, I abbreviated it from here on. It stands for racial and ethnic approaches to community health for Asian Americans and keep on track program. So if, if just reading through that title, you know that it's not Filip just Filipino Americans, but uh, for Asian Americans. 
And then you have your project as Asian American Partnership in Research and Empowerment or ASPIRE, which again is not just for Filipino Americans, but for Asian Americans. And then there was a community health worker health disparities initiative. So the next th uh, three slides, I um, um, summarizing what the results of this are. So the Reach Far Keep on Track program is based actually in New York, metropolitan New York and in New Jersey. As I mentioned earlier, they're just a bridge away. So there were uh, Asian Indians, Koreans, Filipinos, Bangladeshis who were part of this. And so what they did was actually partner with, so these two um, studies were from the same study. So what they did was partner with faith-based organizations and have them be the bridge or the promoter or the champion for this program and really get them to track and we recruit and track and sustain the participation uh, of these different minority subgroups. So they, they reported that the reach far was effective among participants in terms of self-reported hypertension. They were more likely to actually seek, uh, get their follow up with their um, primary care providers, um, appointments and then medication adherence and, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, that, that looked really great. This uh, Aspire, Million Hearts, um, was also done in New York and um, for both of this is in the New York City and they use community health workers. So community health workers are lay workers that are actually trained on the research or like doing on the, you know, for if they are engaged in a specific research or they could have like really formal training to make them community health workers. So in this case, they actually have community health workers that they train to be part of this project who are Filipinos and they speak the Filipino language and so on and so forth. So that is a cultural adaptation that they have done. And, um, so they reported that this was very successful. The community health workers act as this bridge between the patient and the healthcare provider. And uh, reminded them about their appointments and facilitated um, any kind of educational lack of knowledge or need for educational, um, uh, I guess, uh, support. So. Um, if you don't know, the, uh, the healthcare system in America is very, very complicated and health insurance system is really, I, I guess it's really the, the thread that binds it all, makes it more expensive, but also limits, uh, uh, limits a lot of the accessibility uh, to, to access to care. All right. So the other thing is... Um, this is across the US, the Community Health Worker Health Disparities Initiative. And this used, uh, this was actually open to anyone, community participants. There were some Hispanics, African Americans, American Indians, and Filipinos. So there was very low, if you can see here, there were 82 Filipinos as opposed to 354 Ameri African American and then Hispanic. So they, they they reported that they were having issues with actually working with Filipino communities. There was one where they, they said three Filipino sites were not using unique identification numbers, which were needed in order to link their pre-scores to the post-score. So they kind of lost that one. But, but um, uh, this, if you want to read this one, this is actually one which can kind of cue you up with things what not to do. <laughs> But nevertheless, it was a community initiative that was to address hypertension among part of Filipino Americans. Okay, just briefly discussion. So indeed, uh, diabetes and hypertension are significant issues among Filipinos in America, and that's been confirmed by data that were published early on and more recently by our uh, PCORI project. These are, we know that these are lifestyle modifiable conditions and it has been, I think it was Dr. Lopez uh, 
and Dr. Robles that really highlighted that there are things that we can do about it, but it's a significant burden to the self and the family and the community uh, to have these conditions. However, if you can see, if we are one of 3.6 million of Filipinos here in the United States, but we there's only really nine, what, seven? No, seven, seven programs that were done throughout the United States. And if you were noting where they were located, they were actually done in California, Hawaii, New York, and New Jersey. So my, my question is always like, what about the other states? What about other Filipinos? All right, but these studies were very helpful and I have, hope you were able to gain some strategies like, you know, and it, we may have to, to kind of adopt it more to wh where your community is, but there are things that we can glean from it. And for example, partnerships with community organization, professional, nonprofit, faith-based organizations, are really, really very important. And that wouldn't cost any money, right? It's just, um, it's an investment of time that you would have to be able to, to work with these groups. And if you are already, I know nurses, I'm a nurse and uh, I work in the community and I can't tap anyone now because I'm there, I'm there. So if we are already doing that, it's just one step to be able to promote diabetes and uh, hypertension risk reduction. Um, Okay, so cultural tailoring of interventions is very, very helpful in terms of retention rates for studies, mm -hmm. but really I think it's cultural tailoring of interventions is very mm -hmm. important in order to sustain the change uh, for, for the better and for longer in, in the community for, for uh, the patients. So how implications for nurses? So. Filipinos, like, we don't need to even like, you know, think about cultural tailoring ourselves. If we provide the promotion and the, and the uh, intervention to our co-Filipinos, we know what we like, right? We know what kind of makes us go crazy, make us go, um, uh, yes, very like, very excited about to be part of, and we know how we can maintain the engagement, okay? So if you note, if you remember my slide, I've actually partnered the nurses with community leaders. And that's one of the things that, that I, I am really promoting here in the United States. I feel like nurses are not really kind of used as a human capital in terms of research. And I think we have that, that capability to be able to get out there and make a change. Um, either to be leaders to initiate or assist community-based interventions uh, for Filipinos in America, but really where you are right now. I, I read there's Cagayan de Oro from, Ilocano, uh, from Ilocos, from Bulacan, from Iloilo, from um, Australia and US and so on and so forth. Like, like get out there and, and uh, help lead promote and if there are funding resources like apply for them and get them get them to to make them be part of what you do in the community like think of what you can do okay and then um, in terms of research funding I think the the limitations of the number of projects uh, research projects from the community and the limitation of data is really kind of especially here in the United States where research is is supported by the government but it's apportioned all around. So there, there is disparity with regards to where the funding goes. So helping lobby uh, in terms of better research funding um, is something. At, in, the Philippine, in the Philippines, maybe some of you who have connections can already start you know, lobbying for our Department of Health or Department of Health Education to support projects that could uh, promote healthier communities that are that do not that have less risk for diabetes and hypertension. So if you remember the title of my my uh, talk, the other part is global implications. So it's not actually, you know, it's not just the US. Um, this is a data from the International Diabetes Federation, where 
if you see all that, like all the arrows here really are going up in terms of the number of um, diabetes. So we are here in the Philippines. So this area here in the Western Pacific, there is 31% uh, increase. So in 2019, 163 million, and it's projected in 2030, about 197 million and 2045, uh, 2000, uh, 212 million people will have diabetes. And this is all throughout in here. Yeah, Southeast Asia here, 74%, Africa, 140. So it's not just US, it's not just Israeli, it's in the Philippines. Let me give you up in here. This is something that I've seen in the Inquirer. Um, is it's like it's diabetes in Philippines is hitting pandemic like numbers. So one in every 14 Filipino adults live with diabetes. Okay. So what what can you do? Or what about hypertension? So this is from Manila Times written by Aurelio in 2000, Aurelio in 2018. One in four to five Filipinos have hypertension. So it's not just the United States. Indeed, there are global implications. So we can do something about it, right? So what can we do? So participate, promote. Those are my key things. Participate, promote. It's so much that we know about because we are in educa we are educated professionals, or most of us are probably in uh, like working in educational institutions. We know all about this, but there we need to move that knowledge, disseminate that knowledge to the lay people who, who needs it more. So I read this um, from Global Nation Inquirer. Uh, there, there is actually a Filipino diabetes risk assessment, which is an online free. And this was supported by um, Novo Nordisk. Um, it's a 12 question survey, which actually um, assesses for knowledge in terms of presence of uh, type two diabetes risk factors and which are non-modifiable and modifiable. And um, it's just there, like I, I copied just exactly. So learning more about own risk for diabetes is a must for Filipinos. So we need to disseminate that out there. Unfortunately, I actually tried to find the link for this one and it's a free online assessment, but I couldn't find it. So if anyone of you knows that, like feel free to send it to the network and perhaps we ourselves here, the 124, I saw the last one number before I actually shared my slide, 124 or more participants. If you, any of you could find this, get this out. Like a lot of the Filipinos, even like our, like the helper we have at home with my parents, they've got cell phones and they have like Facebook. So we could just send this in and get them to, to, to um, complete this because that could be like a, a, a tool one, when you know what's, what needs to be done, we could, if there is lack of knowledge, we could provide that information and two, it could be a tool for them to know, oh, okay, I can do something about it. Or, you know, there's nothing really much, but I could do something about what I eat, for example. I provided the, the information of the chair of research committee of the Philippine Society of Endocrinology and Metabolism uh, here in case that might be a lead as to how to get that free online assessment. Educate. So yeah, so we are risk factor for diabetes. So uh, there's nothing really much we can do about family history, but there's are other things that we can do about. And then my last message is like, try to make a difference and advocate. So, so if you are interested in looking into the research that I have with Filipino Americans or partnering with me in terms of dissemination of, of health um, related um, information or education. Uh, this is the website for Center for Filipino American Health. And I'll be more than willing and happy to, to collaborate with you at, at, at any, uh, any way that I can be of help. These are my references. And so, so what, what can you do? So let's think about it. What can you, what can you do? And that ends, so, and I would like to end this. I started with this with a thank you, and I would like to end this with a thank you to Mr. Jerome Babare, 
Kuya, I Kuya, I Kuya him. He might be actually younger than me, but uh, has always been very, very collaborative. And um, I credit him for my, I guess, I, I feel it's an achievement to be able to do the teams master, uh, team steps, uh, team steps, uh, steps and performance to enhance patient safety program in the, in the Philippines because he initially connected me with the Philippine Nursing Research Society, which then connected me with a lot of people, which took seven, seven years to actually get the Team Steps Master training, but we have a cohort of Filipinos that are able to train other Filipinos on patient safety. And of course, the Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network, I, I laud you for this activity of uh, bringing in knowledge uh, to the, to, the Filipinos, and I know that there's a huge cohort of you out there, and I thank you for tuning in on a Saturday morning. Um, to the Cavite State University, Ms. Karen Luella Rent, uh, Dr. Dilmondo, and Dr. Robles. I don't think I have been to Cavite, so I, I noted that Dr. Robles' invitation when past when COVID is done. So the project that I shared with you was funded by, by the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute. And I would like to thank PCORI for that uh, financial support. So with that, that ends my presentation. I'll stop sharing and I welcome any questions, comments. And if you do not have any questions or comments, I would like you to, chat of like really reflect on how can you be like an advocate for diabetes and hypertension risk reduction in your own community in your own family okay thank you very much dr danette for that uh it's very refreshing to listen to updates on the two of the top leading causes of, of course morbidity not just in our country the philippines but also in the global fora i like that you were able to highlight how important it is like especially for healthcare workers like most of us to like participate promote and of course educate this in available inter interventions and also program for for diabetes and hypertension. And actually, uh, I got a lot of uh, questions, personal chats, and we, all, we also have two questions in the Q&A. But before we go directly to the question and answer portion, um, again, we are encouraging everyone to please key in your questions. And also we have reactors to react in your presentation. So Sir Rolly, take it away. All right, thank you, ma'am. So our first reactor for today is a faculty from the Cavite State University College of Nursing, teaching for almost 17 years. She's also a medical technologist, a registered nurse, and a medical doctor by profession. Members of the noble profession, guests, let's give a virtual round of applause to Dr. Annie Mojica Ramos. Good morning, sir. Morning, Doc. Hello, good morning, everyone. Good day, everyone. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Bloom, for that very wonderful sharing of your knowledge regarding the um, uh, management and um, prevention of diabetes. It was quite surprising in your show that Asian, particularly Filipinos, has higher risk in developing diabetes as compared to Blacks and Hispanics and also Americans. And I and you also said that BMI 23 is of well, most of the Filipinos already has diabetes, even if they had just 23 BMI, and that's quite surprising. So maybe it has something to do with the uh, familial history or the genetic pool of diabetes in the family. That's why they have higher risk for diabetes. And also, the, as you have said, the type of diet that usually 
is really consumed in the United States quite different here in the Philippines. But it is very informative and very helpful, especially here in the country now, as you have said, in the Pacific Western Asia, that there is an increase of 31% of diabetes. Almost 163 million Filipinos are diabetic. And uh, it's quite alarming because it's a condition that's quite having too many complications and quite ha hard to handle if we won't be able to manage the blood sugar and the, blood and the hypertension also. If we don't manage the blood pressure, it will end up having too many complications and harder for us to manage. So as medical doctors it, and also a professor in Cavite State University, it is a very uh, good uh, very informative for us and also to teach our students, especially in the field of nursing, medical technology, uh, and how we as healthcare providers and uh, allied health should participate and become advocate of this uh, knowledge and uh, sharing of information to the community in preventing these diseases. So it's very helpful that you thought we had from you that mobile health monitoring also helped in checking on patients. Nowadays that there is COVID, um, most of the Filipinos stays at home and we are scared of going to the doctors because of the condition of COVID. So it will, it's harder for them to manage their condition, but to the use of mobile health technologies, I think it will be, it will help them manage their health more and for them to have good communication with the community nurses that also work hand in hand. So thank you, Mom, uh, Dr. Bloom, for this wonderful knowledge that you share with us today. And I hope we as nurses in the Philippines and also doctors and allied health medicine uh, help the community and teach our students more on this topic. And that's all. I would like to thank you for the nuggets of knowledge that you have imparted for us today. Thank you, Mom. Thank you, Dr. Mohika Ramos. Thank you very much. There are actually a couple of questions from um, Mr. Leonard Nuestro. If I may share that. Is that okay? Yes, Dr. Blue. Yes. Okay, so uh, Leonard um, mentioned that, Mr. Leonard mentioned that all the programs being implemented for FA communities for diabetes, um, diabetics, and hypertensives in the US, which do you think will have a high success rate in the Philippines, considering that they should be culturally tailored and also to consider all other related factors? So I think the Fitbit part might not be something that can be used in the Philippines because it's pretty expensive. Uh, even here in the United States, you have to have a, a big research support in order to offer that to your participants, which Dr. Bender had. But they actually also had like a diary um, and noting of what you eat. And I think a very, very important aspect of what they did, did was actually ask the patients about, the, because of the food diary, they were able to actually consider the caloric content of what they, they eat. And a lot of what we eat has lots of fats and salt. So one of the things that I, uh, that is a spin off of that project of Dr. Bender was to actually kind of build a, a build a Fili Filipino cookbook, a Filipino cookbook that's like healthier. So adapting, adapting Filipino dishes, but making it like a, a healthier like version of it. So I think like having like awareness of what we eat is something that can be be done. And a lot of them that those uh, also have exercises, they were mostly they were on their own, but I think certainly it, post COVID because of the COVID um, 
uh, restrictions that you have right now, maybe the community can can have things like a local Zumba, a regular Zumba, or like a walking um, activity, like in the afternoons, if like, you know, you could just like walk around the block or something like that and get everyone out. Um, you know, we love to talk to our neighbors, which do not happen here in the US. You know, I only know three of my neighbors here, whereas everyone in my town and beyond knows about me or, and I know what they are, what's happening with them. So I think uh, it brings out culturally, we love to, to uh, socialize, we love to have fun. I think putting the fun and making the exercise be part of that component. We love to eat. We love, we, we are very festive people. We, we, we equate good food with success and happiness and family. So maybe we should, we can start thinking about, um, you know, if we have a lechon, maybe just eat a little bit of its skin and mostly a little bit, a little bit of that skin with a lot of cholesterol, but more like choose the more lean parts, you know, things like that could, could definitely contribute. And I think uh, from my studies outside of the Filipino American, I hypertensive, you know, if you, you remember the, my, I do a lot of neuro work, um, you know, exercise is really something that can prolong life and have you better quality of life. So even if you do eat like food, if your uh, expenditure is more than what you eat, that could certainly help. And so I think uh, the best way to go about this is a long answer to your question is really like hone our cultural awareness of being together, having fun, you know, dancing, singing, and have that as an exercise activity, like an, an energy expenditure activity that that can help mitigate the other aspect of our loving food and, and so on and so forth. And then there's another question here. So yeah, so the um, Filipino Americans in some states have higher rates of cardiovascular disease and diabetes mellitus compared to whites, black, and other Asian groups. This is this is just this study was done in California. So we, of course, in other states, it could be that it's a little bit lower than the blacks because the blacks has one of the highest rates of hypertension. But uh, what what were they is these attributed to? Very 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 good question. No, I did not mention what these were attributed to. But this study that reported that they also actually reported. If you look at the papers, they they reported to uh, Filipinos most likely to drink soda, um, eat uh, high fatty fatty foods, less likely to exercise. Uh, has two or more jobs, so they are more stressed. And um, so there's there's a lot of those kind of lifestyle modifiable um, issues there and, and so on and so forth. Although, although that recent 2017 paper actually looked at uh, that there might be, and Dr. Uh, Mujica Ramos mentioned about maybe it's a familial tendency there's actually, they, they correlated it with like even the birth weight of the individual. So um, stress, birth weight, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's the whole situation is more complex than we think it is. Um, but certainly what seems to be in terms of the reduction, in terms of research, in terms of reduction in BMI, hemoglobin A1C, and blood pressure, certainly working on diet and, and, and exercise is, is a ve are very important components to that. So if, if I would say, you know, I know Dr. Mojica Ramos, and it's the same with us here because we're in uh, COVID restrictions, so we can't go to the gym or whatever, but like my family and I make it a, a point to just walk around the block two times and to make sure that that um, we do that daily. And I I harp my husband when he's tired. It's like, I don't want to go like, you know, like this is from my studies is, is exercise is key to long health and long life. So, so I think if we could get that, and I think that would be easy to have, if not right now within your family, 
um, make it as a fa family activity, as a bonding activity. You, you walk together, talk about your day, make jokes, you know, sing, you know, we love singing. So that could be something you could have your own Zumba at home. You could have, you know, sing along with a lot of dancing and make that at least 30 minutes per day. Um, that could really go a long way um, in terms of um, diabetes and hypertension. Thank you very much, Dr. Bloom. We have another second reactor. Yes. He's, he is also a registered nurse, an alumnus from Cavite State University College of Nursing, and currently a faculty member in the same institution. He is a former operating room nurse and has been an advocate of diabetic client for almost four years now. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a virtual round of applause to Sir Luis Roderos. Thank you, Sir Raleigh. Um, before I start, I would like sir. to... Yes, good day to everyone. Uh, before I start, I would like to uh, say thank you, of course, to uh, the Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network for having this collaboration with us at Cavite State University. So thank you very much for this. And of course, to our... Um, resource speaker, Dr. Danet Bloom, good day. And of course, to all, all our participants and friends worldwide. Um, well, I would like to say that our discussion for today is very informative and actually not just informative and very relatable, not only for the uh, for the people in healthcare, but also I guess I, I believe that this is still relevant to everyone here um, in our platform. So I would like to share a salute to all the nurse researchers who are who take who have took part in in in, in the studies that Dr. Danet has um, shared with us. Um, it really outlined the health issues among the Filipino Americans or, or the Asian Americans on the different regions of the world. And I, I also agree that the findings that found were really quite alarming, particularly with the fact that um, it could still be increasing. Well, um, I, I will also agree that community interventions and primary care um, is, is really a, a big factor. And of course, we'd always love to hear that um, what we always tell our students when, when, when we teach is that um, early detection and prevention is, is, is actually usually economically better no? for, for our clients. And um, just to tell you a story, I, I, I know a number of people who doesn't even want their their blood pressures to be taken, their their um, random blood sugars to be taken, also because uh, most of them are you know having this reason that they are afraid that they might find something from it and might require them to to undergo some treatment or or maybe they will they will have some burden economically if 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 they have to you know constantly go to the doctor, buy these medicines. And they usually wait for, for something for them to be alarmed before before they actually go to you know, to, to the, the clinics to actually seek for health care. And as we know, your pain is is actually the most common reason for seeking health care, which is kind of alarming also because we know that prevention is always better than cure. And... Um, from the presentation, I also noted that um, there are some findings concerning self-medication, use of herbal medicines, alternative pro products as, as one of the reasons of um, having this uh, no, having this certain conditions that might lead um, the, part, the, the respondents no, to, to, to have certain chronic conditions. Well, um, I, I think most of us will agree here in, in, in most of our um, healthcare professionals would agree that here in the Philippines, there are a lot of um, 
of like marketing strategies which 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 most people think is that this is um some kind of uh information that 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 may help them in achieving well optimum health but this kind of information can be a form of misinformation also which can lead to misuse of um alternative products let's say so maybe something that we can do also in in our end as healthcare professionals is to actually share with them the proper information the correct and valid information which which will help them attain that optimum health and therefore have them um have their factors or their, their predisposing and precipitating factors be less uh, evident for them to 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 have some certain conditions so um with your question dr bloom that what can we do i think i can say that with our roles with our role as a member of the faculty of nursing we can educate the new breed of nurses for them to focus on primary health on pre prevention of diseases on the community level and um we we can do more we can do more by 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 engaging them into into community level interventions um making them realize how important it is for us so again i would like to say um thank you and again hats off to all all the nurse researchers and i hope that, that we can also uh, apply the results and recommendations from the findings of your studies like uh the fit and trim, the PILAM go for health programs. And yeah, nevertheless, I believe also that this presentation uh, really ignited initiatives for us nurse researchers here in the Philippines or even to the student nurses who are listening right now to focus more about studies on community interventions for chronic diseases such as hypertension and diabetes. Once again, thank you very much. Uh, Karen, are we ready question? with the questions? There is a question from Mr. Jandi. Uh, I hope it's a Mr. I'm not very sure. Lauren Stavok, uh, if the patient is taking hypertension meds and is controlled, does he need to undergo labs still after three months like SGPT, lipid profile, fasting blood sugar, creatinine? It seems uh, from my end, it seems a little bit excessive to do that on three months. Um, um, if the patient has normal renal values, renal function or hepatic function, I don't think you have to do that, um, those, those labs, um, or uh, at three months. Um, that's my personal perspective, I, um, I, unless there is a profile of the patient, that kind of uh, potential reaction to or drug-to-drug uh, -drug interaction to the hypertension meds that he is taking, especially if the blood pressure is controlled. Um, however, these would be different from individuals, for example, with fatty liver and other like cytochrome P450 uh, kind of um, metabolism, maybe inherent disorder that can can impact uh, medication metabolism. Um, so, so I think it's dependent. Uh, my baseline answer to you, uh, Jandi, is um, it depends on the patient. But if it's like otherwise normal patient with high blood pressure, um, taking well to medications. Actually, what you would do with hypertension, hypertensive patients first is to kind of do a three-month trial with uh, lifestyle modification, like um, a lot of our practitioners here kind of look at the patient's profile. They, they would ask them to bring a diary, what your, what your daily intake is like, and then um, look it up and perhaps like uh, like work with a patient's normal diet and say like instead of having four breads in a day or two cakes in a day maybe half of that or even zero of that and eat more vegetables and um, exercise at least 30 minutes a day and see if that that's that change the um, level the the blood pressure within three months and if not then you start with low doses of hypertension meds 
That is, of course, unless there are some familial tendency for lipidemia and, and so on and so forth. So this is a, if this can be a little bit, it's a complicated question. I would, my answer is it depends on the patient, but I would, I would start with a behavioral intervention first, if that could be done, unless the patient actually comes in with very high blood pressure, which may be what uh, the, uh, Mr. Luis mentioned about, you know, people waiting until things are worse and people not wanting to know their blood pressure. Um, uh, Sadly enough, the same thing we're experiencing here in the United States in Texas. I do a lot of health screening, free health screening, uh, free blood glucose, free cholesterol screening. And Filipinos do not want to be part, especially if like I do it during fiestas because they say, I want to eat my inasal <laughs> and I don't want to know like what, what I don't know doesn't hurt me. It's like, that's not, that's a wrong. If what you know can help you like, what's this? So, um, Yearly cholesterol is something that we kind of advocate here. Um, yeah. I hope that answers your question. So my baseline answer is it depends on the patient. Thank you very much, doctor. Um, actually, there's uh, another question. He says, are we going to receive a certificate for this webinar? Are you going to give us a copy of the presentation so we can also use it for information dissemination? Thank you. Um, I would like to ask for the e-certificate. Yes, you are going to receive e-certificate. We are actually going to put the link to the evaluation forms later after the Q&A or before the end of this webinar. And about the presentation, we are going to ask, of course, our webinar speaker if she could, of course, like give Thank us you very much. the the uh, presentation in PDF format. If she would agree to that, then maybe we could uh, send it along with a certificate. Um, actually, I'll be happy to share that. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, so, Rolly, we're ready with the question. Just gonna uh, show it. Uh, for question number two, uh, from a private chat, what are the emergency warning signs both for hypertension and diabetes, diabetic patients, and what to do if they experience it this time during pandemic? So emergency warning signs for hypertension, well, that would be a rise in blood pressure, right? So that would be like headaches and so on and so forth. But you would really, the emergency thing that you have to make note of hypertension is the potential for stroke because of the high uh, blood pressure, potentially leading to bleeding uh, on the brain and so on and so forth. So those are, you would, you would have your usual face um, symptoms there, you know, like your, your uh, uh, change in facial uh, muscle tone, you know, left hand, um, uh, like weaknesses and ability to speak and, and so on and so forth. So what do you do? Well, that would be the emergency things about hypertension. Hypertension is a rise in blood pressure. So you probably would have a headache. So um, if you do have the classic warning for stroke, I would go to visit the emergency department. I think you would receive care despite the time of the pandemic. Um, now for hypertension, you would have headaches, probably some uh, visual symptoms like headache in the back of the head, headache in the front of the head, uh, probably some tiredness. So what you do with that is basically whatever stress triggers, you know, increased blood pressure, probably relax and have your uh, blood pressure monitored if you have the blood pressure. So that could certainly be something that, that, that can be considered with regards to um, that hypertension diabetic patients. So for if you are just low diabetic, there's probably not much that you would see. You would have your classic, you know, um, increased urination, increased thirst, and so on and so forth. They're not necessarily emergency signs, but if you're if you're if your blood sugar really rise up so much that you are like get to acidotic state, you would probably have loose gum consciousness, you would have your that um, characteristic um, uh, smell, breath, and, and, and so on and so forth, and loose, lo loss of consciousness. And 
So what would you do? You need for, when I see emergency, that would really be something that is needing, needing emergency, uh, medical care. And you do need to go to the hospital for that. Now, if it's just, you know, if you are, um, if you are in a known diabetic patient and you have, um, you are a known diabetic patient and you are on, uh, on, um, insulin, definitely you need an insulin. Um, then, then if you're a known diabetic and you had an insulin and you are in hypoglycemic state, you need some sugar. So the, the, the quicker the sugar is, um, sugar in the water would be the quickest one to, to increase the blood sugar level. The same with hypertension. If you're known hypertensive, certainly giving, giving, um, uh, your taking your medication because that's one of the issues with, um, hypertension, uh, hypertensives and diabetics is like the adherence to medication. So you need to take your medication. And I would say if you are a hypertensive, uh, I would say invest in, in a blood pressure monitor. Uh, one of the things that really a lot of studies here in the United States um, stay and um, even outside of the United States indicate that if the hypertensive patient has a blood pressure monitor and monitors their blood pressure daily, then they're le more likely to be adherent to their treatment because, because they know their blood pressure. And the same is true with diabetic patients. You may have to invest in um, uh, a glu glucometer and some glucose strips that you can kind of monitor yourself and act accordingly during their emergency condition. So I'm not sure about this emergency part of the question as to what that really looks like, but those are some of the things. Take your medicine. Now, if you, if a, the stroke is not caused by bleeding, but maybe due to um, a, a clot, an embolus, uh, then perhaps potentially I would give uh, aspirin, take an aspirin, but then aspirin, if it is a bleeding, which is mostly related to hypertension, I would not do that. But um, that's always the emergency uh, given like, like a put sublingual aspirin or take aspirin um, for potential stroke. And then note the time of when the stroke, uh, the symptoms start, because a lot of the the first aid for this, the first the intervention, and I'm not sure if that's in the Philippines, but intervention for stroke is very time limited. So within within uh, for TPA, um, you need to be uh, it has to be within the three hours of the start of the symptoms. So yeah, so um, if the individual could speak, maybe what warning signs they're kind of uh, indicating here. So, so in terms of the pandemic, if those are stroke and keto a, like acidotic state or diabetic, you know, ketoacidosis or whatever, you, you do need to see, seek, tr seek treatment and I'm sure they would let you go through. So this is a key thing. You really have to be more like management and uh, have better management for that. All right, question three. Thank you very much, Dr. Blue. We have number three question, and this is... Do people with diabetes have a higher chance of experiencing diabetes? Yes. Yeah, it has been the studies. That's one of, of the things here, diabetes, um, uh, greater BMI, older people, comorbidities, diabetes, and hypertension. Uh, they do have... They're more, actually there, not only serious complications of COVID-19, but there, there seems to be more indications that they're more likely to, if they do get COVID, it's more, it's more serious. So the effect of the, 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 the I guess the, the resistance to the disease is like, you, you, they, there are greater likelihood that they would actually uh, have COVID and then they do have more serious complications. What is the role of acculturation for a better health among Filipino Americans and Filipino Aus uh, Australians? So it is very important uh, that, you know, this, um, this acculturation has to be taken into consideration for definitely for Filipino Americans. I cannot speak to Filipino Australians, but I, I did finish my undergrad in Queensland and I know the diet is so much 
so much uh, different from uh, the Philippine ones. Uh, so is here in America, fast foods are really very, very easy and it's cheaper than healthier foods. So um, a lot of the Filipinos actually adopt to the countries where they're from. So, but I don't know the data for Australia, but I know for the Americans that the longer there was a study that that indicated that the longer they have lived in the U.S., the greater is their chance to have higher BMI, uh, greater likelihood for diabetes, and greater likelihood for for hypertension. So definitely, it has a role. And I think what is happening now, even in the Philippines, is that it's not acculturation per se, but but our lifestyle is becoming more of the first world. So we have a lot more fast foods. We have a lot more transport. Um, I remember when I was uh, growing up, I used to uh, to walk to school, but now my, my uh, niece is driven to school. So, you know, that, that alone makes a lot of difference. And um, so as we are, uh, as our, I guess, style of living is improving. Uh, we are adopting more of the Western style. And so with it are, are the ramifications of the change in lifestyle. So acculturation, definitely if you are in another country, but um, this culture is also brought to our country. So if you actually look, um, uh, last time I, I went home, I was just so amazed of, like people, I usually kind of look and a lot of people are thin. There were a lot of meat people that are like big. <laughs> so I think that that speaks to the, the diets. I'm not sure what COVID brings to us because I guess there's less fast food access and so on and so forth. But certainly I, I could see that, that there is an impact on, on the accessibility of foods that, were, that used to be uh, difficult previously. I hope that answered the question. Thank you Filipino very much. Americans, Australians, originally from Lee, rural areas in the five are more knowledgeable regarding home remedies, traditional healing techniques, and supernatural ailments. Whereas those coming from the urban areas rely more on Western medical interventions on over the counter medications. What are your thoughts? Um, yeah, certainly. Uh, I'm originally from Bohol, so we know. I know a lot of those people that were probably cursed by the black creature on the mango tree next to the house was did have cancer rather than some growth that was brought out by that um, special creature. Uh, creature, but. Um, I think I think the the ones growing in rural areas, uh, in the Philippines, um, and I mean I may be generalizing because I cannot speak for anyone, uh, but I, I I know that I bring in like you know I I love gardening I love I love walking and I love activities and so on and so forth and just because I grew up in in a rural area which may be totally different um, in terms of traditional healing techniques and supernatural uh, ailments. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's, that's a really loaded question there. Um, yeah, there, are, there's, there, there is de def definitely a disparity between those two groups of, of people and how they bring that over to their new home country uh, would affect them. But I, I do, I do, uh, I think uh, Sir Luis mentioned it earlier that you know we have to be a little bit careful with the use of uh, other remedies. Um, there are some of our remedies that we use in the Philippines that are actually useful. Uh, they're like medically, like medically based, like in terms of herbal treatment. But some may not necessarily be true. Okay. Okay, Doc. Um in the Q&A uh, chat box, we have a few more questions, but I guess um, it's already time. So maybe we can answer the la last two questions. So we have your question from um, 
Reggie, how do you pronounce it? Vicencio. Reggie, oh, sir. Um, yes. Uh, I hope it's a uh, sir. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Like these these yeah. names are so difficult now. It used to be Maria something and Jose something. All right. Can you give us tips on how to make the abuse control program more sustainable, uh, especially in communities? That great question and and I love that question because you're already thinking about working with your community. So I would say work with the community leaders and key community people, the one the influencers in the community. So is who is that? person, the person who probably uh, the that your barangay captain, your mayor, uh, like, you know, like you as a nurse, for example, you would have a great influence in there. So work with them and and actually like form a group, like a group of champions and ask them, ask them, do not say this is what you're going to do. You're going to ask them. And this is where PCORI, the patient centered outcomes research that we are doing if you look at patient centered so we center it's in from the community so we ask them like okay there's what is the issue and most likely diabetes would come out it never fails diabetes and hypertension is always number one so what do you think these are the things that we know can help prevent diabetes which of these could potentially we can do in our community that could be can last a long time and it doesn't need to be expensive we can make use of like walking and, and activities and so on and so forth. So I would say partnering with the community itself. You really need to get the buy-in of the community and giving them take, giving them the ownership and giving them the, the ownership of these diabetes control programs so that it could move forward. Uh, there are still a large number of rural communities here in the Philippines, intrinsic to most are using available for surrounding center. Are those of known for lower blood sugar or increased secretion? What can, what is your comment on this? Are there any programs in the US? Oh, sir. Yeah, there is always a program to look at avenues in order to decrease uh, blood sugar levels and increase secretion of insulin. And I think I do some of this. I know I, I have been to a couple of conferences in the Philippines that even nursing students are, are undertaking these projects where they actually like measure lowered blood sugar and and um, uh, better blood fasting blood sugar control and hemoglobin A1C. So certainly, just because they're herbal medicines, like they're not necessarily bad, but they just need uh, they they just need evidence for their use. And um, the more that the evidence would be there, I would would say if you're one, um, uh, Sir Leonardo, if you're one of those who are actually like uh, looking at these effects of these thermal medicines, certainly I would recommend to partner with drug companies. Uh, they're always on the lookout. And if you can, you can actually, if not in the Philippines, you can look up like Novo Nordisk, um, uh, those big pharmas, they're always looking for potential um, drug targets. And you could, they have a platform there where anyone from outside the community could, could actually submit an idea and um, they would support your research or they could potentially compensate you for, for that information. Yes, the, that program is definitely considered here. Okay, thank you very much, doctor. I know that there are a lot of questions, but we can only accommodate uh, that for the meantime. Anyway, now I think it's time to um, award the certificate and Sir Rolly, Yes, Mom Karen. Can you hear me? Yes, Paul. All right. So at this level, we will now award the certificate of appreciation to our webinar speaker. Allow me to read the certificate. Cavite State University College of Nursing, Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network. Certificate of appreciation is hereby awarded to Dr. Danet Blue for imparting her valuable knowledge and insight as a resource speaker during the webinar held on February 27, 2021 via the Zoom with the theme, Evidence-Based Community Intervention for Diabetes and Hypertension Among Filipino Americans, Global Implications. Signed, Dr. Evelyn M. Del Mundo, Dean College of Nursing, and Professor Violeta Lopez, President, Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network. Thank you very much, Dr. Blue. 
Thank you so much for the certificate. And indeed, it's always a joy to be able to share knowledge with uh, our Kababayans in the Philippines, because you know, like you always come up with good questions and you're always very, very, very appreciative. And I'll always feel the the ignition, the, the enthusiasm to, uh, to share the knowledge. So go out there, multiply and <laughs> promote, advocate. Um, and as mentioned earlier, I would, I, I, I really appreciate uh, you being part of this and continue supporting a find. Um, I think this is such a good um, initiative. Thank you very much. The same certificate of appreciation is hereby given to Dr. Annie Mojica Ramos for sharing her professional experiences as a reactor during the webinar held on February 27, 2021 via, via Zoom with the theme, Evidence-Based Community Intervention for Diabetes and Hypertension Among Amer Filipino Americans, Global Implications, signed Professor Violeta Lopez, President Filipino Nursing Desk Corner Network, and Dr. Evelyn M. Del Mundo, Dean of the College of Nursing, Cavite State University. Thank you very much, Doc Ani. Certificate of Appreciation is hereby awarded to Luis Carlos Roderos for sharing his professional experience as a reactor during the webinar held on February 27, 21, 2021 via Zoom with the theme, Evidence-Based Community Intervention for Diabetes and Hypertension among Filipino Americans, global implications. Signed, Bil Doc Professor Violeta Lopez, President Filipino Nursing Desk Foreign Network, and Dr. Evelyn M. Del Mundo, the Dean of the College of Nursing, Cavite State University. Thank you, Sir Luis. You are most welcome. And uh, at this juncture, I would like to call in one of the members of the faculty in the College of Nursing at the Cavite State University. She is also the current president of the Philippine Nurses Association, Cavite Chapter, and the president of the Philippine Nursing Research Society Incorporated, Cavite Cell. Dear participant guests, friends, please welcome Professor Ninita B. Panaligan for the closing remarks. As we all know, hypertension is also an important risk for diabetes-associated vascular complications. Because hypertension itself is characterized by vascular dysfunction and injury. Both hypertension and diabetes predisposes to cardiovascular diseases. And as we, he we uh, all uh, hear it today, the two uh, main uh, diseases that were included in the webinar series talked to us by Dr. Bloom is uh, escalating on the top uh, top and the most uh, dreaded disease, uh, killing uh, most of the people around the world. So we have heard that the current global condition, in particular for Asian and American regions, are very much concerned about uh, fighting and campaigning against the increase of uh, hypertension and diabetes mellitus uh, cases. In the country, in, in the country, not only in the Philippines but around the world. So, uh, reflecting on the shared uh, talk and session to us by our resource speaker, we are actually uh, being challenged to act uh, now, and uh, there is a great call for us to be advocates and to be champions about uh, this uh, campaign against uh, the uh, increasing uh, rate of diabetes and uh, hypertension uh, among the Asian and the American uh, community. So uh, we have heard also from the talk uh, several uh, evidence-based interventions that were mentioned like uh, Fit and Trim Diabetes Prevention Program, the Feel Am Go for Health, the Health is Wealth uh, program, the Stand for Diabetes Self Management program, uh, which uh, all of these programs uh, has its own uh, approaches and design that we can adopt in our local communities as well. 
So for the height pretension program, we also learned about uh, the reach far approaches. Uh, we also have heard about the intervention programs on uh, Aspire uh, for Asian Americans, uh, involving community health workers, and also uh, community health worker health disparities initiative. Uh, we also uh, learned about uh, how to reduce cardiovascular diseases uh, by um, modifying and uh, involving in uh, different uh, behavior prevention programs. And to mention the few, we are uh, also being challenged to uh, uh, adapt and, uh, and uh, engage and use, actually utilize all of these uh, interventions in our own programs, in our schools, in our offices, and in our community as well. Some of these are using and utilizing uh, the diet, uh, food diary. We also can also use or engage in the different feet and uh, exercise program on a daily basis. There are also uh, intervention that were mentioned earlier about preparation on heart healthy foods. So this may involve cooking, preparing a uh, menu and dishes that are healthy for the heart. We also are being encouraged to uh, make use of the technology or make use of um, several strategies on how to promote and uh, inform our uh, community residents about, uh, in particular, maybe reducing so the uh, usage or sweetened drinks or high calorie drinks. No? We can also uh, use uh, or design interventional, uh, which, uh, interventions which are culturally uh, tailored or approaches uh, that are uh, Cool, uh, culturally congruent to what uh, we have in our country for a specific program on weight loss and waste reduction. Also, uh, we are being encouraged to uh, think of uh, approaches on how we can uh, make, a, how we can uh, do energy expenditure activities you know, so, as we, so that we can reduce uh, the high calorie amount in our body, so we can uh, engage to Sumba and dancing or, or, or any ballroom dancing activities. And uh, mentioning all of this as our take home, uh, we are all challenged to also to create a team composed of uh, champions and uh, patient advocate leaders. We can uh, collaborate with academic institutions. So it's not only CVSU, but uh, academic in institutions around the world. Wherein uh, we can also uh, partner with nonprofit organizations, professional groups, as mentioned earlier, such as uh, Philippine Nurses Association, or uh, can we can have a faith-based community as partners. We can collaborate with our uh, local and barangay units in our society, in our community, at the community level. And we can also uh, have collaborations or we can seek uh, support or financial uh, funding from uh, different institutions that can fund uh, projects related to these campaigns and the researches to decrease morbidity and mortality. Uh, caused by hyper, hypertension and diabetes, uh, such as uh, the PC or PCORI or the DOH. You know, we can also have DOH or DOST, PCHRD for the Philippines and other alike in other nations around the world. So um, to end this seminar, this webinar, uh, we are, uh, all of us are very fortunate to listen to a uh, an evidence-based uh, research uh, output coming from Dr. Blam. And uh, hearing this, we are not only uh, seeing uh, the Philippines as a nation, uh, as a nation uh, that, are, that are having a health global or health problems on uh, increasing rate of hypertension and diabetes, but we are also teles uh, telescoping the world 
in a scenario that was pre presented to us this morning that it's not only happening in the Philippines, but it's a global issue and a, a health issue that all of us are to be part of the campaign and uh, part of the of, uh, increasing awareness on uh, such a, a cardiovascular diseases as this. So uh, our sincerest gratitude uh, to our resource speaker, I would uh, say to Dr. Bannon Bloom, thank you very much, Madam, for your for the sharing of your knowledge to all of us, for the uh, very energetic uh, Professor Jerome Babate and uh, our uh, Dr. Lopez, our president for the Find Network Diaspora. And we are very uh, lucky. The College of Nursing is very lucky to have you as partner for this uh, collaborative uh, effort relevant uh, uh, webinar for our uh, global community. And uh, we also want to thank the CBSU technical team. Uh, we have we, our moderators, our panel reactors, and all that uh, uh, took their time and part in um, preparing for this uh, webinar, international webinar series. So uh, today we will be looking forward for a more uh, relevant uh, and uh, timely international webinars such as this. And to all of the participants, thank you very much for all your support and for participating in this webinar. We hope to see you again in the incoming seven webinars of the Diaspora Network and the Cavite State University College of Nursing. Stay safe, everyone, and always adhere to self-care. Congratulations to all of us.